Hello, good afternoon. It is my pleasure to see everyone today for our special Lunch and Learn sneak peek into the newest installation opening at the DMA, Moth to Cloth, Silk in Africa, which is going to be open to the public and you are members in just a few weeks. I'm Susan McIntyre, the Director of Individual Giving, and it is my pleasure to welcome you and introduce our panelists today. Before I wanna introduce everyone, I wanna thank each and every one of you for your membership and support in the museum. We cannot achieve our mission without you, our DMA Circle members. So now our panelists today, we have three wonderful members of the DMA team. I'm so excited to hear what they have to say. Dr. Rosalind Adele Walker is the Senior Curator of Arts of Africa, the Americas, and the Pacific, and also the Margaret McDermott Curator of African Art at the DMA. This is a position Roz has held since December of 2003, and before joining the museum, she was the director of the National Museum of African Art at the Smithsonian from 1997 until 2002, and had been with that institution since 1981. Mm -hmm. Fran Boss is the interim chief curator at the DMA. She, Fran joined the DMA as the associate conservator of objects in November of 2013, and was promoted to full conservator and interim chief conservator conservator in October of 2019. As the leader of the conservation department, Fran works closely with all museum colleagues to integrate the activities of the conservation program across every area of the collection. And last but certainly not least, Mary Nicolette is a Dallas native who've been, who has been part of the DMA team for 19 years. Her official title is Senior Preparator IPM Coordinator, which stands for Integrated Pest Management. Among Mary's many duties, they include being the textile specialist for the preparatory team, and she received her BFA in sculpture from UNT and continues to dabble in fine arts, uh, including crochet and felting in her spare time. Mm -hmm. So this afternoon, we have three kind of distinct parts to our program. We're first going to hear a brief introduction and overview of the exhibition from Roz, followed by our panel discussion. And then we'll open it up to Q&A from you. So please feel free to submit your question, questions anytime during the program, either by sending them to circle at dma.org or submitting them in the YouTube chat feature, which um, should be available if you're logged into YouTube. So now we're gonna turn it over to Roz for speaking on the exhibition. I'm pleased to bring another exhibition from our permanent collection of African textiles to you. The new exhibition is Moth to Cloth, Silk in Africa, and it will open on December 20th in the Textile Gallery and run through October of 2021. About midway through the run of the exhibition, we will make some changes in the gallery so I invite you to come back for part number two. Throughout the world, silk cloth is associated with wealth and status. The rare natural fiber is indigenous to sub-Saharan Africa, where hunters search the forest for cocoons. Silk was traded between African peoples across the continent and was also imported from Europe, India, China, and the Middle East. This installation of cloths drawn from the collection, as I said earlier, explores the production of silk and silk textiles in three countries in sub-Saharan Africa. These are Ghana, Nigeria, and Madagascar. Whether the materials originated from cocoons or was recycled from imported cloth, these silk textiles are the result of complicated, time-consuming processes. I wanted to do this exhibition because I think a lot of people would be surprised that silk is in Africa, that it is produced there. Uh, as I hinted at a second ago, some of the silk was harvested from cultivated silkworms, but in other cases, the silkworms were growing wild in the forest and hunters encountered them in the process of doing their work as hunters. 
uh, collect those uh, cocoons and take them to market where cloth weavers buy them. So we're going to explore silk making and silk textiles, silk clothing in three countries. And we will uh, start by saying that there are silkworms that come from moths. Moth to cloth is the title. And to, below to the left are silk moths. We call Marlbury silk moths. And these are found and cultivated in Madagascar. When you visit the exhibition, you will see uh, a text panel that explains this but you will also see real cocoons. So looking at the map again, you see Ghana in West Africa, Nigeria in West Africa, and Madagascar, which is off the coast of East Africa, out in the Indian Ocean. In addition to information heavy text panels in the exhibition, we offer you three videos which will show you how moths become silkworms, become cocoons, and how the silk is retrieved and woven, as well as how the wild silk in Madagascar is, uh, is harvested and the dyeing process uh, from natural dyes. Our first stop is Ghana. And here you see a weaver on the left at his hand loom, not a machine, but a hand loom, and he is working on a single strip of kente cloth that will be joined with several other strips to make a cloth like the one that you see to the right. There is a story about the origin of kente cloth, and it, it goes that it was Anansi the spider, the source of all knowledge and wisdom, who invented weaving. What we do know is in the 18th century, silk weaving was introduced. The silk having come from overseas trade, from long distance trade, and the silk threads were unraveled so the threads could be harvested and used to create Kente cloths with designs that were desired by the Asante people. In the beginning, uh, the silk kente were reserved for royalty. The first king, Ose Tutu I, is credited with being the first recipient. And he could give kente patterns to people uh, as a reward or to honor them. Kenti is still woven in Nigeria in Banwiri near the Asante capital, and silk is still uh, very, very highly esteemed and valued and reserved for royalty. Our next stop is in Nigeria, where individual strips are woven and joined together to create the voluminous gowns called Riga or Agbada, that Yoruba, Hausa, Nupe, and most any man wears on special occasions in Nigeria. The looms that you see here are hand looms again, and it's men who are the weavers as they are for the most part in Ghana, among the Asante. And you see uh, the lengthwise yarns that are stretching in front of the weavers as far as the eye can see. This prestigious robe, as you can see from the measurements, is very large, 54 by 104 inches. I'll show you an image of a man wearing one in a few minutes, and you'll be able to see how dramatic a robe like this is. Uh, the silk is Sanyan silk. And I must tell you that the silk in this robe, as in the other garments and textiles in this exhibition, are really silk. And I say this because rayon and other synthetic fibers have been introduced. We have taken the trouble to examine the yarns under the microscope, but many people in Nigeria <laughs> who are used to buying such prestigious uh, robes know the difference between 
the Sanyan silk and the synthetic materials. So we also talk about designs and patterns in the textiles and the garments. And here you see very, very elaborate embroidery around the neck, on the chest, and over the pocket of this garment. You see that among the designs here are these pointed forms. Well, those represent knives, and they serve a purpose, uh, not just beautiful to look at, but protective uh, for the wearer. Our last stop is Madagascar. And to the left, you see a woman weaving at a ground loom. She is uh, a Malagasy woman uh, belonging to the Merino group in the highlands of Madagascar, where cloths like the one to the right were woven uh, during the 19th century. They were woven from mulberry silk which is the cultivated silk that was introduced in the early 19th century. They imported the China silk worms, as they are often called. But before they did that, they imported the mulberry tree plants to grow so that when they were ready to begin this industry, uh, they had the food that the silkworms preferred to eat. You'll see this in the video. They really gorge on those mulberry leaves. So this wonderful uh, cloth is made from silk, which was more desirable than the indigenous silk that was growing wild, uh, which produced a rougher textured surface. The advantage to having mulberry silk uh, is simply that it dyes easier and, and uh, produces brilliant colors because of the texture of the silk threads. Throughout the exhibition, you will find contextual photographs of individuals wearing the, the type of textiles that are on display. Uh, here to the left, you see uh, Eshuhini Nana Diko Pim III wearing an Asasia cloth uh, and the gold jewelry that he would wear uh, for a festival. And this was photographed in 1976. But if you were to visit Ghana today, you would see dignitaries and ordinary people on very, very special occasions who can afford silk kenties uh, wearing uh, these fine cloths. To the right, you see a master weaver in Oyo, Nigeria, wearing a voluminous, lavishly embroidered Akbada. As I look at this embroidery, I think about how labor intensive the process is to create a garment of this type. The silk has to be woven uh, into the strips. A tailor uh, joins the strips together. He sews them either by hand or nowadays on a sewing machine. And the garment has to be taken to an embroiderer, uh, usually a Muslim who knows the different patterns, which have meaning, you know, in the Quran. And he's the one who does this lavish, uh, uh, extremely refined embroidery. And uh, then it is presented to the weaver. I learned many years ago when I lived in Nigeria that you can buy these big cloths at secondhand markets, but they still cost an awful lot of money. These are hand-woven, hand-produced uh, items. And because they are made by hand, they are highly valued and highly expensive. The photograph was made in 1951 by the late anthropologist William Bascom. And the other thing I should say is fashion does play a role here. Uh, I learned also when I was in Nigeria that over time, uh, the length of the garment can be shorter or longer at any given year or time because uh, that's dictated by fashion. So you can see some robes in the old days, uh, 
even before 1951, where you would clearly see the trousers that are worn uh, with the akbata. And then later on, the garment may be much longer. The other thing is during the course of the day or in the course of wearing this uh, akbata, the wearer is adjusting the sleeves, these voluminous sleeves. So it's, it's almost like a chore <laughs> choreography and beautiful and wonderful to see as well as when the wearer is dancing because then it is kind of floating around him. So we come to the end of this uh, brief uh, overview of the exhibition. I hope you will come out to see it. Uh, it is filled with beautiful textiles and a lot of information that will help you to develop a new appreciation for silk in Africa. Thank you, Roz. I love the learning more about this exhibition and can't wait to see it in person. So we're gonna jump right into our panel discussion and I'm gonna go to Fran for the first question. Um, Fran, as we just heard, Roz mentioned we took a deeper look at the textiles in the exhibition. What specifically were you looking for from a research and conservation standpoint? Uh, Roz had asked me to do some fiber microscopy um, on the textiles. So as soon as we could get back into the building because of COVID, we were closed for a while. As soon as we could get back in, I, did, I took um, some um, microscopic samples of the textiles, both warp and weft, and I was checking to see if they were synthetic or if they were indeed silk. So I was, and some of them also had cotton too, um, but I was able to suss out whether they were synthetic versus um, cotton and silk, which we were hoping for, and they are indeed um, silk. Mm -hmm. There was, um, it's not only good to know um, for a curatorial reasons, but it's also good for um, us as a preservation team to know that it's an organic material. Um, organics are loved by insects um, and they're, they're fragile. So we, knowing that is important for the continued care. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Well, that delves right into my next question, which is for Mary and Roz. I'd love to learn more about the different special needs you take into consideration when displaying textiles and then anything specifically that was especially for the silk in this exhibition. I don't know if we want to start with Mary, given your background in the preparatory department. Sure. Um, with these pieces, we did have a little bit of um, fun trying to find large enough cases, um, especially the kente claws are quite large. And due to the pandemic, we had budget constraints where we were unable to purchase any more oversized sheets of plexi, which are very expensive and have to be trucked in specifically for us. So um, we had to find these large sheets of plexi in cases that would fit. And um, the best we could do with the kente claws was to actually drape them over a tube so that the majority of the piece is seen, but um, it could fit inside these cases. So um, the casework, of course, is necessary to keep inquisitive hands away from our objects, mm -hmm. but also to keep um, it, in that textile gallery, each of the walls has uh, the HVAC system vent directly over it. So as the HVAC cycles on and off, it's not affecting the textiles because they're inside this case. And I would just add, I think I'd like to add, um, th that there's a concern for how we mount them. Uh, they're on rods, on, on plexi rods, as you mentioned, but we're doing things a little differently than we have in the past. Would you like to address that? We're using magnets now instead of the kind of backing we used to use. I find this fascinating. First time we tried this was in the Power of Gold exhibition, I think in 2018. 
Yes, um, those uh, we have started that probably in the past three years, or maybe it, the first time was for the ex Asante <laughs> exhibition, yeah. um, where there's a large substrate of metal attached to the wall and then covered with muslin so that any um, anything on the metal does not transfer to the object itself. But we have um, magnets that hold the textile in place. Mm -hmm. um, we have the magnets backed with a suede polyethylene, which is Audi tested. And Fran can talk a little more about Audi testing if she wants. But um, then each of these magnets is also hand painted or hand toned <laughs> to where it matches the garment or the textile as best as possible mm -hmm. so that it doesn't disrupt your view of the piece. Mm -hmm. And I might also add about the magnets. The magnets are a new way to mount that is not invasive. Um, so you don't have to stitch something on and off of a support. Um, it's a it's a softer way, it's less invasive. And if we can move towards less invasive ways, um, that's preferable for our textiles that we want to have around forever. And the Audi testing um, that Mary mentioned is an advanced aging test. So anything in and around a work of art in its airspace needs to be audi tested and audi testing is so like the felt that is going to be near it um the paint the the muslin we know we know but we put these through an advanced aging test to make sure that there's no off gassing or discoloration that might hurt the object mm -hmm. thank you fran i love the innovation in finding non-invasive ways to to display and protect our collection. Fran, are there other special requirements for conservation of silk textiles or textiles in general? Um, uh, textiles are fragile and silk especially has um, is sensitive to light, insects, and when it degrades unfortunately it goes through a shattering process so we are trying to it's 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 interesting because the fibers of silk look like glass rods underneath the microscope and when they start to shatter they shatter like glass rods there's there's not once they start degrading it's a sad sight and there's not much you can do so we are trying to do as much preventative care as we can on this side because once you get to the other side you can't go back so we're where we watch the light we watch the humidity we watch the airflow like mary had mentioned before um yeah and we also keep a track of how long each of the works are up on view and so during our team meetings we go through checklists and go well, this one's been on, for, you know, up for five months, so it's gotten five months worth of light, yeah. and light damage is cumulative. So we keep records of this, and then we will make sure that the curator has provided that information, so we can all make a call. Like, well, maybe let's not show this one now. Let's 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 let this one rest. Is there another piece that we can show now? And these textiles will go into dark storage. <laughs> They're going to go into dark storage for a while. Very dark, yes. yes. Very nice. I know, Roz, you mentioned in your talk that there are there's going to be a rotation mid-exhibition of the textiles. Oh, yeah, about five or six months, we're going to rotate out uh, all of the textiles except one. And that's the, the big Madagascar cloth, the uh, Atifakana Bahana cloth, which we have no replacement for. We're working on it. Maybe there'll be a miracle within six months, but these, um, these, silk, these silk cloths are really hard to come by. We were searching for years and this one came along in a European collection. So well, fingers actually across that something wonderful will happen between now and when will that be? April or May, I think. Did I get that right? Yeah, something like that. And it sounds like we're actively acquiring new textiles when we can. 
Yes, the museum has a rather long history of collecting textiles. And uh, a while ago, I think back in the 90s, the a, a textile purchase fund was established for this purpose. We buy cloths from other uh, um, budget lines, but um, and it's been generous. We always need more because textiles are not cheap. Uh, but we will continue collecting, and and I think it's a really good idea because um, textiles are expressive of culture, of religion, of contacts with other peoples in the world. Uh, not to mention, you know, how much we like to wear them. This is something that all God's children do on this earth, uh, for the most part, is that they wear clothes and their choice is being made. And techniques involved and materials. And uh, the, the idea, you know, that you've got silk in Africa was the motivation behind this show. Because uh, we're always trying to find different ways to interpret the material and uh, expand people's horizons and get them interested in something maybe they didn't think they wanted to know. <laughs> that's, that's what we delight in doing. Excellent. Well, I know I've learned just from your talk, and I love the fact that people can come see the exhibition when it opens in late December or in the new year, and then come back again and see it with in a new way after the rotation in late spring. Yes, and who knows, by the time, in due time, you know, maybe COVID will really be behind us, and there's a blank wall in the exhibition where we could install some touchables. And that's the one that's the one thing we miss in this exhibition because since 2014, when we were able to uh, um, occupy that space to to pl place textiles in the gallery and what used to be called the Crossroads Gallery, um, we've you know had a had a good time uh, with the new exhibitions. And each featured ha tangible hands on, please touch me gently kinds of objects. And so it would be great if we were able to give you this tactile experience so you could feel silk and compare it with cotton and with rayon. So my hope is that this is all going to be behind us and we'll put some touchables on that blank wall. But you can stand. At, on that blank wall and look in front of you and see great videos about uh, silk production from, from moss to cloth. Wonderful. Well, and just to wrap up our panel discussion so we can move to, to q and I'd love to hear from each one of you. Um, it's a two-part question. What your biggest challenge moment was in creating the exhibition and installation, and then also your favorite moment from the time spent in creative process and installation. So why don't we start with Mary? Okay, um, the first part to that, um, the biggest challenge, and that is gonna be the Madagascar cloth, which we have not hung yet. That will be next Tuesday, but I had to do some advanced planning as that piece is going to hang with the magnets and the metal on the wall. But the piece itself, I'm going to over exaggerate, but it, it's kind of like this shape. It, it has an arc to the top of it. And so um, in order not to have to have a custom cut piece of metal, um, we have straight bands of metal for the magnets to attract to but I have ordered some specific countersunk washers specifically to put along the top where the metal isn't going to be so that the magnets can hold the very top edge and it won't droop or fall. Um, and so I'm really looking forward to doing that and seeing how that works out. Um, but as far as aha moments we did install one of the prestige robes today mm -hmm. and it um, has a long long tube that, that has a sag to it so our mount maker had to make a very special mount for the neck portion to hold that tube up 
and it looks perfect now and is so wonderful to see. Thank you, Mary. So I'm going to go to Fran next. Your biggest challenge and your favorite moment. Let's see. Challenges? Probably the biggest challenge has been um, the pandemic um, and not able to work together as closely, um, access to the clause and access to each of their brains. Uh, you know, working as a team um, in front of an object has been more of a challenge. Mm. The best part, the funnest part is I love fiber microscopy. Um, I could do deep dive and I could do that all day long. So that is, um, I've got a million other things to do, um, but I love learning. I love, and I think everybody in the audience will too, um, love learning about silk in Africa. I mean, it's fascinating. I mean, we hear about it in India and in China, but learning about it also in Africa is, is, a, is, is great. So those are mine. Thank you. So Roz, big That's challenge. Um, the big, the challenge is to get it right, <laughs> to be the truth police as it were. And um, so the the research and uh, and con uh, creating the knowledge that basically we need for a project like this is a challenge, and it's a fun one because it's about research and learning. And um, and we can't you know tell the whole story. So what's the most important things to have you know to say about it? And um, not feel as I do every other day, oh, well, we could have done it this other way. Um, so, and, and the, the, I'm working with a great team as everybody sees here and everyone that you can't see in the education department, um, as a, for instance. Um, so I know we're going to do a, a, a really good job because everybody's working very hard and we are on, I guess, our checks and balances. And so that works out well. And the the challenge is starting over again, you know, what's going to be the next show in that, in that space? Because as long as we've got a show coming, we've got a textile gallery. And of course, we we everybody. I'm not the only person who can use it. Africa's not the. We've had a Javanese uh, batik exhibition, and eventually, and we've had a Chinese embroidery exhibition that Anne Bromberg curated. So uh, there there are many possibilities for new exhibitions, and you know, don't worry, we won't don't lose the space anytime soon. Excellent. Um, so I think we're going to shift to our Q&A time. I know we've had several questions submitted. Um, one of them asked about the small blue piece featured in the video with horizontal lines inquiring what it was used for. Is this ringing a bell? A small blue piece with horizontal lines? Was that the Madagascar cloth? Yeah. It may be the Madagascar cloth that's not Yeah, made. that's a huge, that, that cloth is five, nine by, what, 10 or 12 uh, feet. It, it's really very large. And it's, it's, it's comprised of three panels that are woven separately and then joined together. It was uh, woven by uh, a woman uh, up until the 1930s, um, when weaving was in, in decline, that has to do with French colonialism, when they wanted to stop the indigenous weaving, <laughs> and then they changed their minds, but that's another story. Um, but anyway, um, this was back in the 19th century when, when this uh, um, weaving was done by women. It was an exclusively women's occupation. And the, the cloth is woven on a ground loom and it has a special heddle that's used to, to help to make the uh, brocaded effect. The brocade designs that are on the weft and that's going across, the warp is going lengthwise, uh, horizontally. 
So um, it, it was worn by a human being, but it was also worn a living human being, but could have been used to wrap the remains of the deceased. In Madagascar, uh, there was a practice um, of interring the dead wrapped in beautiful textiles. And one layer of the textile would have been made, I mean, the cloth made of indigenous silk, which has a rougher texture than the mulberry or Chinese silk, which is very fine and lustrous and so forth. But the indigenous silk uh, was tough as nails and good for burying. And then the most, the outermost uh, covering uh, could be the fine silk. Periodically, there would be um, a ritual involving uh, disinterring the bones, cleaning them, and wrapping them into fine cloths again in a reburial. So it's a way of staying connected with one's ancestors and one's loved ones that way. So um, um, what else do I want to tell you about that? Um, as I said, we have only the silk one. We also have a raffia uh, shawl that was presented in the exhibition before last. Well, in wearable raffia. So it was just taken down a few days ago, a couple of weeks ago. And ideally, we'll be able to acquire more uh, textiles from Madagascar. The other question that probably will come up, and now if you don't mind anticipating this, since we're talking about Madagascar, is um, that's, that's an island off the coast of East Africa, sitting out there in the Indian Ocean. And uh, it's been inhabited for thousands of years, but the earliest inhabitants we think came from Indonesia and brought weaving with them. That area in the Indian Ocean was a great trading spot. So you were getting uh, materials and ideas and concepts and all, you know, coming from India, coming from uh, Arabia, uh, even coming from the east coast of Africa. Uh, and there, um, there is some weaving in Madagascar that is related more to some uh, of the East African mainland peoples. Uh, but here we see a blending of, of, you know, what came from the Far East and uh, developed into something very personal. And the other thing I could mention is the United States of America has an interesting connection to Madagascan weaving in that in the days of um, Chester Arthur, who was president in the 18, was it 1880s? I hope it was in 1860s, I think 1880s. He was a recipient of a beautifully uh, hand-woven uh, textile, silk textile from Madagascar. These cloths were given as diplomatic gifts among the Malagasy people, but also given to visiting uh, 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 statesmen uh, back in the 19th century. They're beautiful. I can see why they would be a perfect statesman representative of the island gift because they're and, and the cloth we have. A, the other interesting thing about textiles is that there are many um, art forms in, in sub-Saharan Africa, we could say that for Africa in general, that have, uh, have ceased because the old time religion has been replaced by Christianity or, or Islam. Um, and in some places, you know, masquerades continue and, you know, there's a dancing and so forth and so on. But in a lot of areas, you know, you don't have carvers anymore. Uh, you, you, you can replace, it pains me to say this, uh, you know, with the Halloween mask. <laughs> it's, it's, you know, it, it could be precious because it comes from somewhere else. Um, um, but uh, and, you know, it's my train of there's having a senior moment. So much to unpack in both this exhibition and the growth of these different wonderful textile and other crafts in African the, continent. The textiles 
are what has survived. That's my point. And in, in the, the old days leading up to the nowadays, textiles, I mean, even among the Yoruba in Nigeria, the Asante in, in Ghana, in other parts of Africa, a hand-woven textile, it might be, you, you know, the recipient might end up putting it on a sofa or hanging it at the windows, but, but these are, are, are precious gifts. They are made by hand human labor, and often labor-intensive where more than one person is involved in making it. The person who finds, who, who has to deal with the silkworms and the moths, I'm sorry, and the, here we go, everybody, <laughs> the cocoons, to uh, extracting the, the, the filaments from these, weaving, spinning, weaving, uh, the tailor, the embroiderer, uh, I missed a step in there. I discovered someone has to draw those designs for the 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 hand embroidery on those big robes, and then the embroiderer comes along. So you know we're talking about weeks and weeks and weeks, maybe months and months and months and months of la labor being expended on making these fine garments. A community of artisans to create one piece. I love well, it. Yes, labor-intensive craftsmanship. I like that. Speaking of all of the wonderful handwork and meaning that goes into creating these cloths, are there differences uh, or identified variations that really um, exist between the African silk and European, Chinese, other silk from other areas? That's a good question, and I'll pass. <laughs> But, um, I can talk a little bit about um, the raw silk is um, can underneath the microscope you can you can see there is some subtle differences between the two. The the Bombay Mor Bombax Mori um, the these guys they're yeah. these guys are pampered pusses. These guys these guys are fed mulberry leaves and they live a um a more pampered life than the ones that are harvested um yeah. the, the ones that are hard so, th so this silk is very soft and under the microscope is is cleaner um less um variations um stuff attached to the fiber the the raw silk is a little rougher it's tougher they're the moths um, eat whatever leaves are around them instead of pampered yeah. with 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 leaves given to them. Um, the the they live a, a, a normal natural life um, and eat so, whatever. So, yeah, tamarind so leaves. They they tamarind and some and and whatever leaves too. Um, and so their their color. There's also a slight color difference because they have more the native uh, diet than just one singular type of leaf. So there's that. I thought I had a swatch with me. Hmm. Brian. And then I know the Madagascar. Um, but have we have some of our longtime members and visitors? Will they recognize any of the other? textiles featured? Would they have seen them in a previous exhibition or installation in the last several years? If if um, our dear friends visited the Power of Gold, uh, Asante Royal Regalia from Ghana, they uh, encountered uh, several, well, yeah, of the uh, um, Asante textiles. So a few of them have, have come back for this exhibition. And Asanyan, that's uh, an indigenous, this kind of tanny color, um, gown from Nigeria was in uh, the C3 galleries a while ago. So it had a nice long rest and, and it's out again. And I think um, those are the only ones that are, are making a repeat visit, a presentation. Mm -hmm. It's great to see them in a new light. In a yeah, you're exactly right. They look so different in this new installation. They really do. I agree. 
Well, I think that's all the questions we have received, but I want to thank Roz, Fran, and Mary for your sharing your time and insights with us today. I know that I have learned more about Lots of Cloth, and I can't wait to see it in person when it goes up on December 20th. I hope that our circle members will consider visiting the museum when the time is right for them. And please let me or my team know at any point if you need assistance getting tickets to visit the museum. And I want to take a moment as this is our final virtual program for calendar 2020. I want to just say thank you again to all of our circle members who make the mission of the museum possible. And I want to wish everyone a wonderful holiday season and a very happy new year. And please know we look forward to connecting with you both online and in person in 2021.